My name is Eben Upton. I, I understand I have the honor of being the second person to request Eye of the Tiger as my walk-up music for this conference. Um, I, that really, really, I'm so sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I run a thing uh, in the UK called, uh, called the Raspberry Pi uh, Foundation. Uh, we make these things, that's a Raspberry Pi. Uh, a little educational computer for kids. And I thought today I would just take you kind of very briefly through, uh, through the, the history of Raspberry Pi, uh, try and give you an idea of what it is we're trying to do, uh, where we're at now, and uh, just maybe a little view of what I think are some of the most hopeful signs that have come out of the Raspberry Pi project over the last two and a half years. So let's begin at the beginning, the history. When I, this thing is a BBC microcomputer. I'm not sure if these things really made it over here. Um, when I was 10 years old, I saved up uh, a lot of my hard-earned money, uh, and I bought one of these for 220 pounds. And this is a, an 8-bit microcomputer. I'm guessing a lot of people my, roughly my age in the audience had 8-bit microcomputers back in the 1980s. Um, and this was a wonderful machine that I first came across at school. Uh, and in common with most 8-bit microcomputers, it had that wonderful behavior that you would turn it on, even if you, maybe you didn't buy it to learn to program. You, might, you maybe bought it to play games on, or your parents uh, bought it for you, to, for you to do your schoolwork on. But all of these machines, you turn them on, and this one makes this lovely two-tone beep sound when you turn it on. And the first thing you see is, is a basic prompt. Um, and if you want to do something else with your machine, if you want to play a game or you want to do your school your schoolwork, the first thing you have to choose to do is you have to choose not to program it. Um, and this was a wonderful introduction to programming for a lot of people of my age. Most people my age knew at least how to write that two-line program, you know, 10 print, I am the best, 20 go to 10, or 10 print something much filthier than that, 20 go to 10. And you go into a computer store and type that into all of the machines and then hit enter on all of the machines and then run out the door and then stand there with your face up against the glass watching the clerks run around in the store trying to, trying to, trying to shut these machines down. Um, and that meant everybody my age had some exposure to computing, and the vast majority of people didn't then take it any further. Um, but some people like me um, got into it a little bit more and started to kind of slide down this, this kind of inexorable slope. And there was never one day when I, and I think this is true of most of my colleagues uh, of a similar age in the industry, um, there was never one day when we woke up and said, you know, I'm when I grow up, I'm going to be a computer programmer. But one day you, you wake up and you have grown up, uh, and you are a computer programmer, and that's your job. Um, now, I didn't go straight into the industry. Um, I went to this place instead. Um, this is St. John's College, Cambridge. Um, the University of Cambridge is one of, the, one of the best places in the world to study computer science, I think. I turned up there in about in 1996. Um, and to get into Cambridge and to study computer science in 1996, I had to fight my way over a giant pile of other people, all of who had had so a similar sort of experience to the one I'd had. All, a lot of people who, on, on day one, had been programming for 10 years. And in fact, the first term of the computer science course in 1996 consisted largely of taking uh, you know, young smart asses like me and beating us over the head um, to try and convince us there was stuff that we didn't already know, that we hadn't learned in those, in those, those 10 years. We had a wonderful thing called functional programming, which is very good for beating 18-year-old uh, assembly language programmers over the head and scaring them with. Um, and this was a wonderful experience for me. I was there as an undergraduate until about 2000. Um, I did my PhD, um, and then about 2000 and about 2005, I took a job as what's called a director of studies. Now, the job of a director of studies at uh, a college in Cambridge is to organise the undergraduate teaching for a subject and to um, and to arrange for there to be more undergraduates. So to go out and find uh, high school students who want to study computer science. And I mean, this was a wonderful. I was really looking forward to this. The the interaction with the young, you know, the existing computer scientists was was really really wonderful. Um, but. It rapidly, I got to December of my first year, which is when we interview um, people in their final year of high school to come to university, um, and I had a really dispiriting experience because this had happened. Um, this is a graph of the number of applicants to study computer science at Cambridge uh, between uh, 2000 and 2008. So there I am in 2005, and the number of applicants to study computer science at Cambridge had roughly halved in the last five years. So we'd gone from having maybe a 10 to 1 over subscription ratio to more like a 4 or 5 to 1 over subscription ratio. And you can see 2005 wasn't even our worst year. So by 2008, we'd fallen to a point where we had barely more than three applicants for each place. Um, absolute disaster for the university. Um, you know, the university is very used to being able to go and pick and choose from, uh, from a very large number of people. 
the raw numbers actually understate the, um, the severity of the problem. Because what we found was people coming in the door, and these were still bright kids. We've never had a year at Cambridge where we failed to find enough bright young people to fill our courses. But what we did find was that the people coming in the door had virtually no, by sort of 2005, and certainly by 2008, had virtually no experience of what anyone in this room would understand to be computer programming at the point where they came in the door. So our first term had turned from um, beating already very uh, well sort of self-taught people over the head and convincing them that we had something to teach them to doing something that was much closer to actually remedial teaching, to teaching them these things that 10 years before we'd been able to assume that they already knew. Um, and we kind of asked ourselves uh, what had gone wrong. And the, we put our fingers on the disappearance of machines like the BBC Micro. Um, in about 1990, those machines started to be replaced. For game playing, they started to be replaced by games consoles, which are closed platforms. There's never any risk of you turning on a games, a games console and accidentally becoming a computer programmer because they're completely closed platforms, right? Um, for productivity applications, it's been replaced by the PC. Now, the PC is an awesomely programmable piece of hardware, and certainly since the advent of, of widespread internet access, um, it's been possible to go out and get free tools um, to, to learn to program with. But the thing is, almost nobody does. It's almost like children are 10, you know, it takes 10 minutes to take a freshly installed PC and get Python on it. Um, but no, hardly anyone does. It's almost like you know, children everywhere are living 10 minutes away from a fantastic playground that they never visit. Um, and so we started to ask ourselves, a group of us at the university started to ask ourselves, well, you know, this, these machines went away. These machines were good for us. These machines went away. I wonder if we could, I wonder if we could recreate them. Um, and we, we got it in our mind, and this was as early as 2006, we got it in our mind that we wanted to make something which was um, fun. It's, these things had to be fun. These weren't going to be worthy platforms. We have to remember, I didn't buy my BBC Micro to learn to program on. I bought my BBC Micro to play computer games on. So we wanted a platform which was fun for kids. We wanted to have a platform which was cheap. You're going to ask kids to buy a new thing. And um, our idea of cheap was, well, we thought, thought a school textbook. If we can make a computer which costs the same as a school textbook, um, well, you, you, we know schools can ask kids to buy textbooks, right? So this, the, this will be accessible to everyone. Um, of course, our idea of the cost of a school textbook was 25 US dollars, which turns out to be wildly out of sync with what a school textbook school textbook actually costs. Uh, I think if we'd, if we'd had a, uh, a more realistic conception of what textbooks cost, then you know, we might have had an easier job with the engineering later on. So we wanted to have something which was um, fun, something which was uh, cheap, something which was very robust that a child could put into a school bag and take out 100 times and it wouldn't break. And finally, of course, we needed something which was programmable. We wanted a device that we could bundle every programming tool you'd ever heard of onto. And we tried a bunch of different things. Um, and by the tail end of 2011, so almost exactly three years ago, what we had in our hands was this. And this is a Raspberry Pi. This is a very early Raspberry Pi Model B. Um, this is based on a, a, an ARM, it has an ARM processor. It has 256 meg of RAM. Uh, you can plug it into your TV. Uh, so there's no need to go and buy a, you know, buy a monitor for it. Um, and we had very, mild, very modest ambitions for this device. You know, our idea was we were trying to solve a little problem at Cambridge. We were trying to solve a, a small problem. Uh, and we thought if we could make 1,000 of these, get them into the hands of the right 1,000 children, then we could get our applicant numbers up. And that really was the scale of Raspberry Pi's ambition. But after we started talking about this in 2011, we, um, after we started talking about this in 2011, we, had a, uh, we started to notice we were getting an awful lot of traffic to our website. Um, by the start of 2012, we were starting to get worried as a little charitable foundation. So Raspberry Pi is a charitable foundation based in Cambridge. Um, we were starting to get a little bit concerned that we weren't going to be able to make enough of these, that the, you know, we had enough money on hand to build maybe 10,000 of these. We really had scratched around and found enough money to build 10,000 pies. Um, and we, uh, we thought those 10,000 pies not, might not last us very long. We thought those 10,000 pies might sell out in a matter of a few weeks when we launched the product. And it would then, then be a big delay before we, could, uh, before we could get more. Uh, now, fortunately, we were able to do a deal with a couple of uh, uh, UK-based companies called RS Components from Premier Farnell, who agreed to manufacture the Pi for us under license. And that's really been the thing that's enabled Raspberry Pi to scale. Uh, these are big, publicly listed companies. Uh, we 
concentrate on the things we're good at, which is designing the Pi and maintaining the Pi brand and maintaining the educational community around the Pi. And they concentrate on the things that they're good at, which is logistics and planning and distribution. Um, it's just as well we did that deal. We did that deal. We signed the contracts for that deal the day before we launched. It's just as well we did, because on the day we launched, we sold 100,000 Raspberry Pis uh, and took down both companies' websites, um, which was a disaster. <laughs> This was an absolute disaster because these are the two largest distributors of electronic components in the UK. Nobody could buy resistors for 12 hours. So uh, we actually had, uh, we actually had, um, our hosting is provided by um, a hosting company run by some old friends of ours called Mythic Beasts in Cambridge. Uh, we actually had people phoning them up, asking them if they could take our site offline so that, uh, so that they could uh, buy resistors. Um, so that's the Raspberry Pi. Um, Launched it on the 29th of February, 2012. Uh, pro tip, uh, don't launch things on the 29th of February in a leap year because it means your anniversary parties suck. Um, and we launched these, and like everybody else, so one last little tidbit of history, like everybody else, um, we thought um, uh, to make cheap electronics, you go to China, right? And we built our first Raspberry Pis in China. In fact, we had a fantastic, given that we were babes in the woods, we had, a, we had no idea what we were doing. Um, we had a fantastic experience of building electronics in China. We built about a million, the first million Raspberry Pis in, in China. But one interesting thing that happened on the 29th of February was I got a call from these guys, and these guys are Sony, you may have heard of them. They have a factory in South Wales uh, that used to make televisions. Uh, and somebody from Sony got in touch with us to say, um, uh, you know, we think, on, on launch day, got in touch with us to say, you know, we think we could make this for you. Um, and over the next six months, we did a lot of work with them. And in August of 2012, UK made uh, Raspberry Pi started rolling off the lines. And about a year after that, Chinese made one stopped rolling off the lines. So for over a year now, all Raspberry Pis have been made in the UK. And the interesting thing is, we are not making them in the UK because we're patriotic. We're not making them in the UK because we're nice guys. We're making them in the UK because we are cheap. Right, and we, we care about we care about product quality and we care about product cost. So it's been a wonderful experience for me. I was born about four or five miles from this factory. It's been a wonderful experience for me to realise we can build the cheapest computer in the world in the West and save money doing it. So that was that's kind of our history. Uh, since then, we've sold. So at the point where we started building at Sony, we'd sold about a million. Since then, we've sold another three million. So we've now sold over four million of these little devices. The first pallet of Raspberry Pis we ever got back from China had 2,000 Raspberry Pis in it. So we're now at a point where, for every Raspberry Pi in that pallet, there is a pallet of Raspberry Pis. So we've squared up, which is kind of quite a nice place to be. Now, I have an enormous slide deck of Raspberry Pi projects. But I don't have very much time, so I'm only going to inflict three of them on you, three of my absolute favorites. Um, astrophotography, we make, a, we, make a camera, we make a camera board for the Pi. And a lot of people taking those camera boards and plugging them into telescopes and doing these really beautiful pictures. I've seen pictures of Saturn imaged using a Raspberry Pi. It's absolutely remarkable. Um, Another space-related one, I'm a child of the 80s, so I'm a natural-born space cadet. Um, this is another space one. A guy called Dave Aikerman in the UK, he likes to stick Raspberry Pis under balloons and send them up to 40 kilometers um, and, and take pictures. We did actually drop Babbage, who is our mascot, our teddy bear mascot. We dropped him from 30 meters higher than Felix Baumgartner um, last year. So we, we did hold, until that chap from Google beat us a few weeks ago, we did actually hold, we believe, the skydiving record, admittedly not for a human being. Um, but there's a certain amount of R&D going on at the moment to see if we can squeeze another couple of kilometers out and uh, reclaim our crown. And then the last one, this is an art installation. When we started doing Raspberry Pi, I didn't for a moment think that we were building tools for artists. Um, this is a little art installation of little uh, paper boats floating in one of the docks uh, in the east end of London. Uh, and as people go past, there's a train track in the background there. As people go past on the train, they can text the installation and change the color of the boats. Now, which is really sweet. I, I love this. And there are loads of artists doing this because it turns out that previously, if you wanted to do an art installation, the way you'd do it is you'd find the you know, crappiest old laptop you could and hide it somewhere inside your art installation and come up with some way for it to drive the, uh, the signals in your installation. Why have I picked these three out of my big deck? What's great about them all is these are all projects done by adults, right? Um, these are all projects done by adults, but they're all projects which we see increasingly being replicated by kids. There's a wonder, been a wonderful flow on our website over the years where maybe for the first year we were writing about what we were doing and then for the second year we were writing about what adults were doing with the Raspberry Pi. 
And then over the last year or so, what we've increasingly been, write, uh, been writing about is what children have been doing with the Raspberry Pi based on projects like this that adults have been doing. So this one, there are now high school kids sending balloons up. I'm, I hope this time next year there'll be primary school kids sending balloons up. I'm hoping, you know, we may uh, sooner or later run into issues with the Aviation Administration in the UK when you can't see the sun for all the balloons. But uh, this is wonderful. It costs about 200 bucks to do this. Right, every primary school in the country, every primary school in the, in the developed world and a lot of the developing world can have its own space program now. You know, this stuff is wonderful and, you know, like I say, I'm a space cadet. Okay, where are we today? Um, July this year, we launched this thing, which is the thing I was holding up. That's the Raspberry Pi Model B+. Plus. This is a tweaked up version of Raspberry Pi that, was, that we produced by listening to all of the objections that people had had, all the complaints that people had had about the original Raspberry Pi for two years. That's our $35 Deluxe uh, B+. 15 days ago, we launched this chap. This is a Raspberry Pi A+. Plus. Um, our original idea of making a $25 computer seemed kind of infeasible at the time. One of the wonderful things that's happened is we're now buying so many components, we've been able to take another five bucks off it. So this is our $20 computer, and I just quite like that idea. The $20 bill is like the universal currency, right? You can go to any bar on the planet, maybe not the one next to my house, but pretty much any bar on the planet and buy beer with a $20 bill, because everyone knows what they are. And now you can, you've got the universal currency, and you can swap the universal currency for a universal computer. This has been, uh, this has been very popular. Um, a lot of the activities about Raspberry Pi are coordinated through our website at raspberrypi.org. Um, we originally saw ourselves trying to solve this problem, this education problem, just by making a little computer. The success of Raspberry Pi among children, but also among adults and in industry, has given us a source of funding that we've been able to use to produce large quantities of, of uh, free educational material, which we post on our website. And most exciting for me, the ability to do this. This is a thing called Pi Academy. This is the brainchild of a lady called Carrie Ann Philbin, who we hired at the start of the year. This is teacher training. This is free, high quality teacher training based around the Raspberry Pi in support of the new curriculum, the new computing curriculum uh, that was launched uh, in September of this year. We've so far put 150 people uh, through Pi Academy. Uh, I really didn't see myself running a teacher training organization three years ago, but the, uh, this has been massively successful, and this is really something I think in 2015 that we're hoping to roll out further. Um, I guess the last thing about what's surprising about today, um, here's a graph of traffic to our website by country. Um, we had this very parochial little idea of trying to solve a British problem in Britain when we started. You can see now by, by far our largest um, source of traffic is the United States. Um, a few months ago, I, I took this graph and I normalized it by country population and I noticed something kind of fun. Uh, and I went back and I was, had my fingers crossed last week and I went back and I ran, the, ran it again. Hey, there we are. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> this shouldn't be a surprise to me, I guess. You know, we, I, I know, you know, a lot of the computer games I played, I had a Commodore Amiga when I ditched my BBC Micro. A lot of the computer games that I played when I was a child were written here in Sweden, right? Um, you know, we know that, you, you, that, that here you had exactly that same sort of culture that we had in the 1980s, but it's extremely heartening to see, uh, to, you know, to see, to see that graph. That was 1% ahead when I looked in July, so it was really wonderful to see it jump to more than 10% ahead on a per capita basis from the UK. Really, really hope that in the next, it'd be lovely for the UK to catch up. I mean, it is an English language website, it's the other thing as well. You know. um, it'd be great for the UK, UK to catch up. Really hoping that some of these ones that are in the, I get to use my laser. There we are. So I was offered a laser, I didn't have anything to point it at. Um, here we are. We're hoping that some of these ones, we can pull these ones up to this kind of level. We've got three countries kind of leading the way here. And the hope is 2015, these guys will pop up. And I'll fall over. There we are. Um, Cool, tomorrow, uh, what I hope is gonna happen in 2015 um, and beyond, two cool things. In June of this year, we launched this thing. This is the Raspberry Pi compute module. One of the surprises for us about Raspberry Pi is that people have been taking Raspberry Pi and embedding it into their own products, using it to, to make their own products. Um, a problem with the Raspberry Pi, you can only use it to make a product which is this big or bigger. You can't use it to make a tiny little product. And if you wanna put your, if you wanna have interfaces on the outside of your board, you need to put them where we chose to put them. So we introduced this thing. This is the brains of a Raspberry Pi. Laser again. This is the brains of a Raspberry Pi on an SO DIM. Um, a card with an edge connector. Um, hopefully, what we're hoping, we really want to, we see a lot of people 
trying to build, using Kickstarter to build consumer electronics, trying to build consumer electronics on Kickstarter. This is a great example. This is a, this is a, um, a home media center called Slice, which uh, funded successfully over the summer. Um, and we really hope the compute module can kind of be the, you know, one kind of leg. I guess there are, there are, there are some interesting things going on, right? You know, the internet has given us um, wonderful access to the information we need to make our products. And it's given us a wonderful way to reach potential customers for our products. Crowdfunding has kind of, so it's kind of democratized access to information. We all know that. Crowdfunding has done a similar thing for capital. So things like Kickstarter and Indiegogo have provided us with a basically democratized access to capital. They've removed gatekeepers from access to capital. We see Raspberry Pi, and in particular things like the Raspberry Pi compute module, which has enabled this, and also this guy. It's a little uh, point-and-shoot camera called Otto that successfully funded back in May. Um, we see the Raspberry Pi compute module, the Raspberry Pi itself, other platforms like Arduino. We see these as being sort of the third leg of that tripod. They're, they democratize access to high technology. They make it easy for people to get their hands on the technology that they need to build these interesting products. So that's a cool business thing. Should probably, just before I finish, mention the mission. I had a really depressing graph at the start, and I didn't feel it was fair to leave you with a depressing graph. Um, this is a continuation of that graph. Um, you can see that um, this, is, this is by year of entry, so these are people who are gonna join us. So this, this bar chart here is hot off the presses. This is information we got in the last couple of weeks. Um, you'll see that Cambridge numbers, Cambridge applicant numbers are now above the level they were at during the dot-com boom. Right, we did see a spike. You know, if you go take that back into the late 1990s, um, we did see a run-up for the dot-com boom and then this slump. We've now actually managed to come back to better than we ever were. Uh, absolutely wonderful students. My my college uh, uh, this year will have admitted. I think we're I think we're talking about admitting as many as six. I think when I was doing, it, I was able to find two people to come to my college. Now we're talking about admitting six people and going back to the administration and asking for permission to uh, admit more. So I think there really is there really is good evidence that the mission is being accomplished. Um, we can't claim credit for all of this. You can see that 2000, 2012, by 2012, which was our launch year, this slope was already pointing upwards a lot. And this is, I guess this is a consequence of Raspberry Pi being part of a very broad movement, things like Code.org, Code Club in the UK, Code Dojo throughout Europe. There is, I think, a growing awareness that we need more engineers. There's a growing awareness that um, increasing access to an engineering education uh, is an important thing to do for children, is an important driver of, particularly a driver of social mobility. Um, and um, so it's a kind of broad coalition doing this. And I think certainly the future um, for computing and computer engineering is looking a lot more hopeful than it was back when we started Raspberry Pi. So thank you very much for, uh, for your time. I will be around for some of the rest of the afternoon if anyone would like to ask questions. Otherwise, cheers. Thank you very much. That was a really success story. Yeah, crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, that's great. And I know from my colleagues and others that this is a really, really popular tiny little thing that they can do amazing things with. So. We have a little something for you. Uh, according to the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, almost 3 billion people are online. That is 40% of the world population. And uh, my colleague, Rika Dahlstrand. <laughs> wow. Yeah. This is a plaque he made. And of course, it's made using Raspberry Pi. Every maker's favorite to make things happen. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Wow. <laughs> thank you. I made a rattling sound. <laughs> <laughs> so, um